This is episode 62 of the Women in Depth podcast. The information found in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hi, and welcome back to Women in Depth. I'm your host, Dr. Lourdes Fiato. Today, we have a wonderful guest joining us who has graced Women in Depth with her wisdom, expertise, and insights, and this is Dr. Janice Webb. She first joined us in episode 11, where she spoke about her pioneering work in the area of childhood emotional neglect, or CEN, and her groundbreaking book, Running on Empty, Overcome Your Childhood Emotional Neglect. Today, she is here to continue and expand that conversation, talking about her new book, Running on Empty No More, Transform Your Relationships with Your Partner, Your Parents, and Your Children, which takes the concept of CEN and expands it beyond healing yourself, teaching you how to deepen and repair the relationships with the most important people in your life. Some of the things you'll hear in this episode are how CEN affects your choice of partner, the three types of emotionally neglectful parents, three things you can do now to change your parenting style with your children, regardless of their age, and the biggest mistake parents make across the board with their children. Dr. Janice Webb is a clinical psychologist and best-selling author. She is recognized worldwide as the pioneer of emotional neglect awareness. Throughout the last 25 years of practicing psychotherapy, Dr. Webb noticed a distinct pattern of complaints among her clients. In searching for the common cause of this cluster of symptoms among highly dissimilar clients, she discovered the source, emotional neglect during childhood. Dr. Webb has been interviewed by NPR and the Chicago Tribune, and her work has been featured in Psychology Today, Elephant Journal, and many other publications. After receiving thousands of requests for help from people all over the world, Dr. Webb created Fuel Up for Life, an online recovery program for childhood emotional neglect. She writes a weekly blog on the Childhood Emotional Neglect page on psychcentral.com. Dr. Webb runs a private psychotherapy practice in Lexington, Massachusetts, where she specializes in treating childhood emotional neglect in couples and families. Hi, Dr. Webb, and welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Lourdes. Thanks for having me back. I'm so excited to um, have a part two to our conversation. Um, When you were here during episode 11 and you spoke about childhood emotional neglect as the invisible experience, I had so much positive feedback. It's one of the most downloaded episodes, and I'm so glad that you are back today to, to speak more on on childhood emotional neglect, and specifically how it affects relationships, parenting, and children. Yes, thank you. I'm I'm happy to hear that there were so many downloads. That's fantastic. Yeah, it really resonated with so many. And as I've told you before, I would say, you know, I don't want to say all, but most of my clients are dealing with childhood emotional neglect. Yeah. I think um, once you start seeing it, then you see it everywhere. I mean, that was my experience. When I started becoming aware of it, I started seeing it all over the place. And, you know, people have it to different degrees. And I'm sure this is true of your clients. Some of them might just have some of, you know, a touch of it, or there's a whole continuum. And then some people are just defined by it. Yeah. And it's interesting also in the healing process that just different degrees of awareness and beginning to integrate the tools can really shift their experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I find for sure that when people begin to really see the problem and talk about it using the right, the words that really can explain it, it makes them feel so different about themselves. And it's very empowering and just opens up a road to change. And that's really a 
fun thing to do with someone as a therapist, yeah. I think. And I just want to extend to you my gratitude and thanks as a as a therapist for the work that you've done because it has really helped me to feel more effective with my clients. And I am, I'm sure a lot of people feel this way about you, but I'm, I know I'm one of your biggest fans. Oh, thank you. That's yeah. Great. Yes. I'm so glad. Yeah. Your, your book is like worn thin. The one I, I probably need to get another one. <laughs> I'll send you another one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so I want to, for those who are just joining us for the first time today, I want to kind of do a few basics. And so could you just share what childhood emotional neglect or CEN is? Yes. The way I define childhood emotional neglect is it's simply a parent's failure to respond enough to the child's emotional needs. So it can, it can be very, very subtle. It's, it's actually what the parent, it's not something a parent does to a child. It's something that a parent fails to do for a child. So the parent may be parenting in many ways very, very well and have all the best intentions but yet just fail to notice what the child is feeling enough and fail to respond to the child's feelings enough, and the child receives a powerful message. Um, It's an unstated subliminal message, but that message is your feelings either don't matter or are unacceptable or unaccepted. And um, the child has to do something with that, so they adapt. And the child pushes his feelings down and away and walls them off on the other side of a wall. And that might work okay in the childhood home. But as an adult, we need our feelings. So there are scores and scores of people walking around without the kind of access to their emotions that they need to have in order to live a really fulfilling and happy life. I really love the way that you have defined such a, I guess it's it's a very complex experience. And I love that you use the word enough, that it, it's a parent's inability or failure to respond enough. And that CEN is about what doesn't happen, because I think that's also why it's so easy to to dismiss when, the, when you share it with them, because it, it doesn't seem like it's such a big deal. It's, it's, it really seems like it's nothing because it kind of is nothing, right? It's a non-event, but it's a non-event that has a huge impact on who you grow up to be. Yeah. And I, and I think we, I know we spoke to this um, in our first conversation that for many, it's even just getting to the point where they can take this seriously. Like this is something that happened and it affected me and it was big, you know? Exactly. A lot of the value of that is that it removes the self-blame out of the equation because most people who grew up this way because they can't remember what the problem was, they blame it. They blame all of their struggles as an adult on themselves. They just feel like, okay, something is just wrong with me, which is what I ended up naming the fatal flaw. It's just like this deep seated feeling that you're different from everyone else and that everyone else is like connected and like on the inside and that you're disconnected and you're on the outside. And it really is just, it really is just because of your feelings are pushed away. But until you realize that you just feel like it's something wrong with you as a person. And for those who are just joining us for the first time, and this is your first time hearing about childhood emotional neglect, if you check out episode 11, or if you purchase Dr. Webb's books, you will be able to see a breakdown of what, I guess, the, what behaviors and qualities are present when you, when you have experienced childhood emotional neglect. So I'd like to start with, you know, something that grabbed my attention with your book is you talked about the three big questions you get. <laughs> and I was wondering if you could talk briefly about that. Yes. This, these were the reason I wrote the book, really, because I've, I get lots and lots of emails and comments from people. And the three big questions that I get over and over and over again are, I think that my husband or I were emotionally neglected 
and it's in our marriage. What can I do about it? And the second, and, and all variations of that, the second question is, now that I understand that my parents emotionally neglected me, it's hard for me to be around them because I feel very differently about them. What can I do about that? And all variations of that. And the third question is, I'm afraid that I'm passing this childhood emotional neglect down to my own children because one of the things about CEN, this is a little bit of an aside, is that because it is so invisible and so subtle, it does just naturally pass down from one generation to another. So part of seeing it in yourself for many people is seeing it in their own parenting. And so people very understandably and nat naturally feel upset about that and concerned and want to know how they can fix this in their relationship with their children. So those are the three big questions that motivated me to write this book. And it's what the book is all about. Absolutely. All three sections. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, it, it, yes. And so I would encourage um, listeners to definitely check out this book because, you know, you do a wonderful job of laying out every, the responses to those questions and how people can begin to actually integrate real solutions beginning immediately. And they're not difficult, the things that you can do. Right. Um, once you know what you should do, it can be remarkably easy to, to just put it into action. And then a lot of times you get really quick results too. So yes. that's really the great thing about it. Yeah. And I think, you know, that getting the quick results also helps the individual to start feeling a sense of, um, you know, feeling good about themselves, feeling good about the progress they're making, beginning to see shifts in how they relate to others and how they feel about themselves. And I think that that's one of the, one of the best things that I, I love about working with this area is, is seeing clients begin to feel excited and feel good about themselves. Yeah, it's, um, it's really amazing. And such a big part of how we experience our lives depends on our primary relationships. And if those are not happy or if they're one-dimensional or there is hidden resentment in them, or lack of attention to people's emotions. I mean, that's all it takes. If you have that, which is the primary symptom of CEN, if you have that in your relationships, it's, it's hard to really feel fully fulfilled or happy in your life. And once you start, it's like the secret missing ingredient. Once you start adding it in, the effects can be amazing. So I'd like to uh, touch on every section a little bit just to give our listeners a sense of what, what they'll find in each section and also, you know, just highlight some of the things that you mentioned. There, there's so much good stuff and obviously we can't get to it all <laughs> in this right. conversation, but I'd like to, um, to touch on a few things in each of those areas. So let's focus first on childhood emotional neglect and relationships. Okay. Okay. One of the areas that, that stood out for me is you talk about how childhood emotional neglect can affect your choice of partner. And I thought, thought this was really amazing to, <laughs> that, you, um, that you wrote about this. And so could you share a little bit about that? Sure. I think well, probably the, the number one way that it can affect how you choose your partner is that it really, it, it sort of programs the way, I mean, therapists know this, that the way that we experience love from our parents as children sets us up for the type of love, for what will feel like love to us in a partner. So if your love from your parents has everything in it except emotional attunement, then you're probably going to go one of two ways. You're going to either be drawn to someone else who has CEN because they're not emotionally attuned. And so their love feels like real love to you. And they're also comfortable, not most comfortable not talking about their feelings. And they're not comfortable having conflict either. So that makes, makes it much easier for you to be in a relationship with them. The other option is you might feel very drawn to someone who has a lot of emotion, who's very emotional, because they sort of fill up all the empty space that is left by your own la lack of access to your own feelings. 
And so that can either go well or it can go askew if the other person takes up so much room that it just continues to squelch you. And people with CEN have a tendency to be drawn to people who will take up too much room. Interesting. I, I see both. In my practice, and I will, I have to say that it leans in the direction of being in a relationship with someone who is more expressive with their emotions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I agree. And then you also, you spoke about a skill set that's required for those who are in a relationship that's, that is emotionally connected. And I felt that this was really, I, I love that you did this, you know, you, you, um, first you highlighted the effects of the relationship, and then what a relationship actually looks like when it's healthy. And could you speak about that? Sure. In a healthy relationship, both people are, you know, no one is perfect at this because emotions are so difficult. But in a, in a healthy relationship where neither person grew up with CEN, there is a willingness to disagree with each other and an ability to have a conflict and no like if each person knows how they feel about something and also understands how emotions work so that they're, the way they feel doesn't necessarily make them right, but they need to listen to the way they feel, then the two people can discuss problems together and get upset and stick with it and talk through something. And, you know, that's the hardest skill in the world for pretty much everybody in a relationship. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> that's just hard, let's face it. It is. <laughs> but people with CEN really have trouble with that. They have problems knowing what they feel. They have problems being able to understand what the other person is feeling. They have problems putting their own feelings into words and staying in the conversation when they're feeling upset or angry or hurt. CEN people really tend to avoid or shut down overall. So all of these skill sets in terms of reading emotion, reading your own emotion, putting them into words, being able to, you know, knowing who you are and how you feel about things and being able to communicate about that. That's a whole set of skills that if you grow up with CEN, you don't have them naturally, but you definitely can learn them. So that's the great part. So how can someone tell if their relationship is affected by CEN? Well, in the book, I think I had like seven or eight bullet points on that. And essentially, the things to look for, for are conflict avoidance. And, um, you know, which means basically, if you get upset about something, you just wait until the, you're not upset anymore, and you don't say anything about it. Of course, those things fester and they don't really go away, but it might feel like they do. But conflict avoidance, a feeling like the other person doesn't really know you on some level. They may know your favorite foods and, you know, things that are really observable, but just feeling a little bit like you should, you know, you should know me better. You're misreading me totally. That's a sign of CEN in a relationship. But, you know, the one you just mentioned, that's a big one that I hear about where they there's a sense that the other person doesn't get them at all. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a painful one, too, because yes. it, it doesn't feel good to feel like the person that you've been with for however many years really doesn't understand you. Yeah. That is a very difficult one. And and it's not that the other person doesn't love them or isn't trying. They just or maybe they are. They they may be trying. They may not be trying. But if they are trying, they're just not able to, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it, it really does. You do have to have skills in order to be able to really know someone on a deep level. You have to have emotion skills because emotions are the deepest expression of who a person is. So if you're not good at reading emotions in general, you're not going to probably be good at reading them in your partner. That's just a hard reality. So I'm going to encourage uh, listeners that if you want to know what the other <laughs> indicators are that your relationship is affected by CEN, Dr. Webb goes through those in, in the book so you can get more detail on that. One of the things that stood out for me in this chapter is how you talked about assertiveness as a conflict management tool. 
And I love this because I feel that so many people are afraid to handle conflict or deal with things because they actually think it will make it worse. And there's difficulty in discerning what's assertiveness. And so I'm, I'm so glad you included that. And I would love if you could speak a little bit more about that. Absolutely. I, I love assertiveness. It's really, <laughs> I'm a big fan. <laughs> Me too. I love it. <laughs> yeah. It's really just a, a series of a group of skills and people can learn those skills. And um, so the definition of assertiveness, a lot of people have a little bit of a, an off idea of what it means, but what it really is when you boil it down is just being able to say what you need to say in a way that the other person can take it in but also saying it. So it's not so passive that the other person doesn't get the message and it's not so aggressive that the other person can't shut down, that the other person is too offended or hurt and shuts down because once someone does that, you've lost them. So assertiveness is is just walking that line and essentially it requires the same skills that we were just talking about. It requires you to be able to know what you're feeling, put those feelings into words assess the situation you're in, assess who the person is you're talking with and how they usually feel about things or how you think they might feel about this and just choosing the right place, the right time and the right words and the right tone. Tone is really important yeah. to say to them what you need to say. And being able to do that all, you know, in the moment is, is really a skill that has to be worked on by most people. But it's okay. You can start out, you know, sort of thinking about the situation after the fact and, and coming up with a plan and then going back to it. And the more you do that, the better you get at it. So in the second part of your amazing book, you talk about CEN parents and the three categories of CEN parents. So could you share what those three categories are? Sure. They are the self-involved parents. And these are parents who might be very taken up in their own lives and just don't have that much to give their children. So they might be narcissistic. They might be addicted. They might be a workaholic. But it's a parent who really is just more, more taken up with their own interests and their own life and their own needs than, than their children. The second group is struggling, and those are parents who are trying very hard to just survive, and so they might be, you know, a lot of people grew up with parents, you know, a single parent who is, you know, working three jobs trying to support the family, or, you know, a sick relative that's being taken care of, or one of the children in the family has challenges. So it's that kind of a situation, struggling financially, a problem that's taking up the parent's time and attention to such an extent that they really are not noticing their own child that much or enough. And then the third group is, I think, probably the biggest, and that's the well-meaning but neglected themselves parents. And these are parents who might be giving their child everything, and it might be even a stay-at-home parent, but if that parent grew up themselves with their parents not noticing their feelings enough, chances are they're going to have the same problem with their own kids. So these are the hardest parents to spot. And these are the parents that the children will grow up and look back and say, I had wonderful parents. They were great. They gave me everything. Whatever's wrong with me, it's my fault. And I think too, that that this is where the guilt and the struggle comes in with accepting that Childhood emotional neglect um, was their experience? Yes, exactly. It's really hard to get people to, you know, I've never seen any group of parents more, de- patients more defensive of their parents than people with CEN. Yeah. And it, it's often because their parents did love them and gave them so much. And you, it's hard to believe that. Just the fact that they failed you in this seemingly unimportant way could have such a big impact. Yeah. And I, I feel like, um, you know, one of the ways that I try to address this when I'm working with a client is, you know, your parent loved you and this happened. It's not an either or, you know, it's, 
and it's not a, you know, it's not a judgment of your parents. It's just understanding what happened so that you can move forward and heal. Exactly. I, yeah. I mean, some parents deserve to be judged, but the huge majority really don't. Right. right. The huge majority of parents really are doing their best. And I absolutely give every parent incredible kudos in general and really try not to blame them unless, like I said, it's a parent who really didn't try or was really abusive or something like that. But most parents really don't deserve blame. They just did did their best. They just didn't know. And I and I also wanted to add, you just reminded me right now too, if if a child experiences um, you know, physical or sexual abuse, then I would say that more more than likely they're also going to ex- experience CEN with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. It's embedded in any kind of abuse from a parent because if you think about it, of course, you can't abuse a child in any way without ignoring their emotions and overriding them. You know, I also wanted to tell you that I really love your choice of um, examples that you use throughout the book. I felt like they really, really helped to get a feel for what the concepts were. And especially in this area where you talked about the three types of emotionally neglectful parents, then you also went into how you might feel if you have these parents. That was that was amazing. I love that. <laughs> oh, good. I I wor- worried a little bit that it might be hard for people to read. Really? Because it, it's almost kind of. Um, I think one of the people who read it for read the manuscript for me said, "Wow, this was intense." It is intense. I have to say, yeah, it is intense. But I feel like it's powerfully healing, and it helps you to really because you might be reading the descriptor and thinking, ah. Oh, you know, maybe that was my parent, maybe it wasn't. And then you read the feelings that you will experience if this was your parent. And it's just, it's almost like it makes it really hard to, um, to deny or not look at or see. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think, um, I think when I was writing that, that was a really hard chapter to write actually. Interesting. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What, what made it so difficult to write? Um, I think it was, I don't know. It was, I found it emotional. Yeah. It was very intense for me to write it. So I'm glad to hear that, that it was validating for you because that was my intent all along. So I'm really glad. Well, I think it is, it's not an easy chapter to read, but I feel like it, um, it really helps you to see things that maybe are difficult to see. But yeah, I, I read that and also the examples and it was just, like, well, if you weren't sure and you weren't clear, you are now. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> um, exactly. So, you know, another uh, part of this chapter that I really loved is that you went into boundaries and self-care. And one of the things that you wrote was your parents did give you life and they raised you, but they, that does not obligate you to give them carte blanche positive feelings. And I thought that this was uh, powerful because it really gives – the individual with CEE and permission to have a different experience. And this is a big deal. Yeah. You know, I've been thinking about this. I really think that um, the human brain is, I think that we're all born with our brains probably just set up to respect and love our parents. Don't you think? Yes. And so, yes. And we all hear that too from the media and everywhere. We get those messages. If you don't love your parents, you must be a bad person. Yeah. Or if you don't respect them or if you don't treat them a certain way. Mm-hmm. But that's just not healthy. That does not contribute to the survival of the species, actually. I think that's probably what it was intended for. But it just, it, I think it, you know, if you put your parents' needs who are, neglecting you emotionally, if you ignore your own response to that, you're not helping yourself or your children. You know, I think another one of, you know, this is probably my second favorite. There's a tie, okay, Um, Uh of what I was reading. But I also love in this section of the book, you created a self-care chart. And basically on one side, you had what your parents didn't do. And on the other side, it's now what you're doing. And I love this because I actually do this exercise with my clients where I ask them, think back on your childhood and what did you need most that you never got? And they'll tell me, 
And that is something that actually right now they need and want very much. You know, it's showing up in some way, whatever it was that they didn't get. And so Mm -hmm. this was a, this was, this. I felt like this really kind of expanded that and took it into into more depth. And this was another one of those, like, wow, your eyes just kind of open and just really sits with you. It's very intense, but I love this chart. Oh, good. Yeah. It's, um, it's hard, I think, to grasp that you can give yourself what your parents didn't give you, but you really can. People yeah. really can do this. So I was just trying to like capture it in a, a little, it's, it's kind of a little chart. <laughs> well, I love, it's just so simple. Like, you know, your parents didn't, you know, pay attention to, to, to routines or, or having you go to bed early or, you know, eating the right foods. And then, so that means that now you also have difficulty taking care of those needs for yourself. And I, I'm going off the top of my head, so maybe you can share some of the more specifics, but, you know, that was kind of going from memory. <laughs> what I can yeah. Remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, it's what your parents didn't give you and what you should be doing now. Yeah. So it's um, like if your parents didn't notice what you were feeling, so now you, know, you pay attention to your own feelings and take them seriously. Uh, your parents didn't, like you were saying, enforce healthy habits. So you now pay attention to yourself and enforce healthy habits. Yeah. So it's, it's like that. I think there are six or seven in there. Yeah. It's very empowering because it lets you know that you can make these shifts and begin to heal yourself. You're in fact reparenting yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. On an emotional, yeah. in an emotional way, you're reparenting yourself. Whatever your parents did well for you, you don't have to redo. You only have to really just fix this emotion piece. Yeah, and it's a it's a big piece. If you can fix this piece, it's going to permeate every aspect of your life. Oh, without a doubt. Yes. And then this is a, okay, this is another favorite part of <laughs> favorite part of the book for me because this is something I hear about all the time. You know, I got an email from my dad and he wants to do this, this and this. And I just know it's going to be awful, but I feel like if I don't go, this is, you know, it'll hurt his feelings. My, my siblings or family will be upset. And I loved how you talked about when you are making decisions around setting limits, boundaries, self-care, you, your quote was make the decision based on what it costs you. Right. Emotionally. Yes. Could you speak about that? Yeah. So I think that, you know, I think people really, because they believe that, and they feel that their parent, that they should, you know, there are a lot of shoulds that are just inherent between people and their parents. And so you feel like you should do certain things and be a certain way, but that actually costs you something. When you put your own feelings and your own needs aside too much in any relationship, it's, you pay a price for that within yourself. And so I came up with this equation where you try to name the emotions, the positive emotions you have when you see your parents, and then you name the negative emotions that you have when you see your parents, and then you weigh those out and figure out what's, which, does, which direction does this balance in? Does it go negative or positive? And then make your decisions based on that. Because that honors your own experience and your own needs. And, you know, that's if you're not going to try to to fix things, which is also a possibility in a lot of parent-child relationships. What I love about this, um, this formula that you created is I think it validates to the person why they're struggling so much with this decision. And it helps deal with the guilt. And it also lets them know that the reasons for your struggle behind this decision, um, makes sense because you're having all these feelings. Yes, yes, exactly. You're not choosing to feel that way. It's just naturally how you feel. Yeah. And and, and you're not a bad daughter or a bad son and you're not being selfish because this really just lays out the emotions on both sides. And, and I speaks again to why our, our emotions are so important because they let us know what, what we're feeling and the direction to move in based on those feelings. Yes, exactly. That, you know, emotions just give us so, so much direction. I mean, some emotions we really shouldn't be listening to. They might come from the past or 
be somehow connected to something else. So there is some sorting that has to happen um, because obviously emotions shouldn't just be trusted completely at all times. But if you do pay attention to what you're feeling, your emotions really will tell you what, what to do in a lot of situations. I love that you just mentioned that too, because um, it's true that I think that's part of this emotional skill set is knowing when to, when your emotions are leading you in the right way. Yeah. Because, because one of the things, um, you know, I, I've told clients and, you know, so this can sound a little confusing is just because you feel it doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, just because you're feeling abandoned doesn't mean you're being abandoned, you know, those types of things. And so this is part of, I think, of that discernment process of really looking at what you're feeling and is this feeling accurate? Is this feeling from the past? You know, so I'm really glad you, you spoke to that. Yeah, it's it can be hard, but the more the more you do it, the easier it gets. Yes. And the more you understand yourself and what you're like, if you know that you have an abandonment issue, right. then when you feel abandoned, then you know, wait a minute, here's that feeling. Is this, is the way I'm feeling does it really match this situation or might it be that it's bringing up all my old stuff? So that was uh, an amazing section of the book and that was just part two. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we through. <laughs> wow. Yes. It's just so incredible. And, you know, again, I just want to tell our listeners, we are just touching on a few of the sections, um, a few pieces of each section. There's so much in this book and I'm just so excited that this is available and people can, get their hands on it and begin to to heal or deepen their healing process. So we're going to now talk about children. <laughs> and, you know, you wrote a, a chapter on the feelings of the CEN parent. And I just really felt a lot of compassion when I was reading this. And your, the examples you used also really, I think, will, were helpful in connecting with what parents might be experiencing when they are parenting and they've experienced childhood emotional neglect. Can you can you share a little bit more about what parenting with CEN might feel like? Yes, I think um, actually this is the this is the part that was so hard for me to write. <laughs> <laughs> I was wrong about the other part. Sorry about that. Well, um, I can relate. <laughs> I can see that this would be hard. <laughs> yeah, this makes a little more sense. Yeah, this was really difficult, and I, I think it's just because you know I'm a parent. And I learned so much of this the hard way and so many of these feelings I've had myself. So writing this was very emotional for me. But, you know, that aside, if you grow up with CEN, I think that it really makes you feel differently about your parenting than if you didn't grow up with CEN. And so the feelings really are just this kind of sense of, other people having more, like being more somehow connected with their children. A lot of CEN people tell me that they know they love their children. They just can't quite feel it. And I think that just comes from the sense that there's just something they can't get a hold of that they know they should have. And again, that's just those, those feelings not being there. They're, they're there. They're just walled off. I think CEN Parents have a lot of guilt that they're not doing things right with their kids. It's a lot more confusing to parent if you don't have a good understanding of your own feelings and be able to read your child's feelings. And, you know, that's the definition of CEN. So I think being a a parent with CEN, it feels confusing. You can feel really lost um, in terms of trying to do the right thing. And yet whatever you try doesn't seem right. And maybe it doesn't really work. And one of the characters in my book, um, I think it was the mother, yeah, the mother named May. She grew up with CEN and her experience is very, I think, a really good example of what it's like to be a CEN parent. It's just it's just more of a struggle and a self-questioning and self-doubt and guilt yeah. And a feeling like something is missing. I think that would be the best description. Yeah. I and I think that um what you described is also what I see strongly with my clients and there's this sense of just this is so hard for me and I'm not doing it right 
And it's a different, they don't relate to when maybe other parents say, oh, I'm having a hard time or this is a struggle. It's a deeper feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas other parents might talk about their struggles, I think to the CEN person, it just doesn't feel like they're talking about the same thing or at the same level. I, I think too with CEN parents, it feels like it's mostly a struggle. Like there's, they don't, from what I'm seeing, and it's it's more of a, I struggle with a lot of it. I'm not enjoying it. Um, what's wrong with me because I love my child, but they don't, they can't seem to get to a place where some parents might be able to see the struggle and the positive. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think when you when you feel confused and guilty and you're not sure what you don't feel confident in what you're doing, it's easy to feel burdened by being a parent. And so this is a really great example because a lot of people will say, you know, parenting is so hard and I'm exhausted and that kind of thing, but it doesn't quite capture that burdened feeling that a CEN parent is more likely to have. I like how you said burdened. That's a good word for it. Yeah. So one of the things that you talk about in this chapter is um, how a parent can start to change. And I think that that's something that also, for many, they feel like, this is, how could I possibly change? Can you speak a little bit about how a, how a parent would see and can begin to make some shifts in how they experience parenting? Yeah, so I think it, it depends a lot on the age of, of your children, of course. So that's, I did try to address small children versus adolescents versus adult children because they're all different. But there are a few uniting principles that apply to all three. And one of those is to just try to talk more. And if you if you watch parents and children just when you're out in public or whatever, sometimes you'll see parent like a, a kid who's just talking and talking and the parent is just not paying attention at all. And, you know, all parents are, you know, no parent can be constantly attentive to what their child is you know, jabbering about. Right, I know. <laughs> they talk so much sometimes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you, you know, you do have to, to, there needs to be a discourse. So just talking more with your child, no matter what the age, whether it's a young child, whether it's an adolescent, whether an adolescent are kind of a special case, but, um, or an adult child, having just exchanging more words is a good start. You know, like if it's an adult, call them more often than you usually do, you know, within reason or just reach out more. Just try to make contact more. A second way to do that is to just use more emotion words when you talk. And that works with all all three ages with small children. You know, you choose different words in different situations. But, you know, instead of saying you look tired, you could say, you look like you've really done way too much stuff. Do you, you know, are, I can't tell right now if you're sad or if you're tired. So give them some options and even talk about your own emotions more. Use, use more emotion words talking about yourself. The more you get in there, the better. And the third thing that you can do is ask more questions. And that, that works for all three ages as well. Because questions convey interest, and that's a good thing going for, in the direction from parent to child. Interest is, is a huge key to having a good relationship. Yeah, I, I love all of those, and they are th- simple things that you can begin to use right away. Um, one of the quotes you, one of the things you wrote in this section that really stood out for me is, you said that when you react to what your child does, you are likely missing what she feels. Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest mistake that parents make with their kids across the board. And especially CEN parents, you know, are very, very prone to this. And, you know, we all want our children to be well behaved. It's just automatic because behavior is important, number one, and it is so visible to everybody. And how a child behaves affects everyone around them. So, and we can, you know, we can see it and children's behavior impacts us, but the behavior is not really, the behavior is a symptom. The behavior is driven by a feeling. 
And so if you can, instead of immediately reacting to your child's behavior, try to think, what's my child feeling right now that's driving that behavior? And try to address that. That will give you a lot more reach with your child and a lot more connection. And it's a very powerful thing to do. So what would you say are, you know, in writing this book and in your research, what has been the biggest uh, surprise for you in this process? Oh, that's a good question. (laughs) I've had lots of surprises. Okay. You can tell us a few if you want. (laughs) (laughs) You don't have to just pick one. (laughs) Um, I think that one of the biggest one is how deeply this topic affects people. I really didn't expect that people would feel so intensely touched by it. And it's been such a wonderful experience to just see how people respond and how much they feel about it and how much it changes how they feel about themselves and their their lives. That's just been an incredible experience getting all of these responses and emails and comments and from people that are are just very touched by this whole idea and feel like they they finally understand what's been wrong with them their whole lives. That's just been amazing for me. It's yeah. been an incredibly rewarding experience. I, f- I feel like the work that you've done in this area bringing this to to light to teaching the world about this you know, what a healing gift you have created uh, for for people now and for generations to come. This is really powerful, the work that you've done. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're so welcome. I'm, I'm, and you know, and I'm so grateful to you too, because, you know, you've really impacted the word, world of counseling and psychotherapy as far as expanding our understanding of what our clients are dealing with and how we can support. And so, yes, this is just a, an amazing body of work that you have put together and are continuing to add to. Well, thank you. And if, um, if any therapists, licensed therapists are listening who would like to help people recover from CEN, they should email me because I do have a, a list on my website of CEN specialists because people are looking, people are looking for you. So. <laughs> So could you please share, um, you know, the best way that anyone who's interested in your work, you know, non-therapists as well, can get in touch with you and share some of your resources that you have for those who would like to learn more or heal and definitely share about when your book is coming out? Yes. So the best way to find out more information is go to my website, which is emotionalneglect.com. And there is on there is all kinds of information And one thing I would recommend, if you're not sure whether you have CEN or whether you grew up this way, you can take the Emotional Neglect Questionnaire, which is on my website, and just sign up for it and take it. And also, I have a blog on Psych Central that has a lot of, lots and lots of information about CEN um, and how it impacts different areas of life. And the new book is called Running on Empty No More. Transform Your Relationships with Your Partner, Your Parents, and Your Children. And it's coming out November 7. And it's available for pre-order now. And I'm so excited about your book coming out. I just want to share with our listeners that I truly feel this as a therapist, as an individual, that regardless of what your struggle is, being emotionally skilled is going to heal and transform your life in so many ways. So it doesn't matter regardless of what your current struggle is. I think everyone can actually benefit from becoming more emotionally attuned. And the work that you've done has really created a a place for people to begin this process. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I agree. So thank you so much for spending this time with me today. And I'm very excited about sharing this conversation with the world. Thank you so much. I enjoyed talking with you. Take care. You too. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation with Dr. Webb. 
one of the things that stood out for me was Dr. Webb's description of what it feels like to be a CEN parent. I also love Dr. Webb's formula that can help you make decisions when setting limits with emotionally neglectful parents, and that is making decisions based on what it costs you. I also loved how Dr. Webb spoke about assertiveness and its significance in managing conflict. And it also stood out for me when Dr. Webb said that when you react to what your child does, you are likely missing what she feels. For show notes to today's episode, please visit www.lordesviato.com forward slash women in depth, where you will find links to all the resources mentioned. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe on iTunes or share with a friend. Again, thank you so much for listening and see you next time.